Hi, my name is Eric Greenleaf. I am a professor of mental health counseling at Nova Southeastern University. Uh, and today I'll be talking about the impact of social media on all of our lives, but particularly on adolescents. The title is The Impact of Social Media on Teens, What Can Be Done? Uh, it's had an impact. Uh, and I, I don't know if most of us have spent that much time really reflecting on the, the degree of that impact, how quickly this technology washed over us, uh, and how integral now it is to our lives, particularly our social lives. It, it, I, I think metaphorically, it's a bit like a tsunami, where in the last 10, 11, 12 years, we've had a tsunami of technology washed over us uh, and, and, and inundate us um, with, uh, with, with social media uh, to the point where we spend, in most cases, for most people, hours every day of our lives uh, checking our phones, uh, getting onto uh, different apps, um, you know, and, and, uh, and, and to the point where most people, most mornings, the very first thing that they do uh, is check their phone. And the last thing that they do <clears throat> when they go to bed that night is to check their phone. Uh, and I'll be talking about it a little bit later, but many, many adolescents and probably adults too, but many adolescents will wake up multiple times uh, in the middle of the night uh, to check their phones, uh, which of course interrupts their sleep patterns, and has detrimental effects. So um, maybe it'd be helpful to spend a, a little bit of time here kind of gauging the severity of this problem, like how big of a deal really is this? You know, maybe, maybe uh, our use of social media is not that big of a deal. Um, maybe we're, you know, well, making too big uh, of, of an issue about it. So uh, it, it may be helpful then to yeah, clarify um, our, what, what are its potential risks. Uh, how widespread are those risks and its effects? Um, and so we can get a maybe a, a sense of the size uh, of this problem. So let's uh, let's start then by looking at um, there we go. Um, how social media works, and to that extent, or to that that sense, we we need to talk about algorithms. All social media operates um, with certain rules um, and the certain programming, if you will. These are a set of instructions that uh, solve a problem um, and accomplish a goal or task efficiently. And all social media operates through algorithms. Uh, and um, well, they take the uh, they 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 take the steps of operation to an end goal. There's a there's a destination in mind with any set of algorithms, and social media then is it has a destination. There is a goal in mind, and what is that goal? What is the destination of social media? Uh, what, is, what is the the goal of these algorithms? Well, the goal is screen time. That's it. Um, and well, what social media companies, of course, uh, 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 spent really years figuring out uh, is how the human mind can be hacked through algorithms to accomplish the goal, which is more time spent looking at our phones. Uh, there's a saying that if uh, you're not paying for a product, uh, then you are the product. Uh, and, and similar to that, it's an understanding that when you use social media, uh, you are not the customer. The customer are the advertisers, the corporations that are paying the social media companies um, uh, for, for, their, for their time. Uh, we, well, we're what they want. Uh, and the algorithms are designed to get, get them what they want which is eyeballs looking at screens. Um, you know, to that point, there are approximately 2 billion people in this world who are on Facebook. And 
if they can increase the amount of time spent uh, on Facebook by just, let's say, five seconds a day, it's not much, just five extra seconds a day for two billion people is, well, not that great at math, but that's a whole lot of time that advertisers are benefiting from if they can just increase viewership or you know, time spent looking at Facebook by just five seconds. If they can increase everyone's time on Facebook by one minute, that's two billion times one minute. That's a lot of minutes. Uh, and so it's big money. And you have to understand then that the, the, the reason for social media, the point of these algorithms is to, well, get us to look at these screens, check into our phones, stay on Facebook, get in TikTok, um, get on you know Twitter, whatever other kind of social media platform more often because that is what is the moneymaker behind all this. So um, ultimately then, then, well, it's for your viewing pleasure because if the goal then is to increase time spent uh, in the social media platform, well then it, the algorithm needs to know you. It needs to understand what you want. This is why, of course, uh, many social media uh, platforms are described as echo chambers, where you can hear news, or read news that is catered to you. Um, things that you read or see are things that, that you would agree with, things that uh, would please you or infuriate you uh, and, and make you angry, um, which is also uh, likely to increase your level of engagement. So whether it pleases you and affirms you or makes you angry, uh, it accomplishes the same effect. It's to increase the level of engagement. So th this is why you can get into um, you know, YouTube or into Facebook or, or others. And it, it just seems to know what you want to see even before you thought about what you wanted to see. Um, it, it knows you in some ways you know, better than you know yourself. It knows what you want and what you need in order to stay on the platform. Uh, so what's going on then is, is the our unconscious mind is making a connection between the stimulus, which is rewarding to us, uh, and the the, the use of social media in, in a very real way. Um, social media is like a drug because it accomplishes the same task as a drug. It releases dopamine as well as other neurotransmitters. Um, but dopamine is one of the bigger ones here where every time you check your phone and there's a like or someone says something this or says something that, then it releases a little bit of dopamine and that feels good and we crave dopamine. Uh, and sometimes you check it and there's no like, no one said anything, there's nothing interesting. So you put your phone down, check it again a little while later, still no one said anything. There's nothing, there's nothing new to respond to, um, no likes or anything. A little bit later, you check it again. Oh, wow, this is happening and that's happening. People like this, they posted and whatnot. And that's what, you know, intermittent um, um, positive reinforcement. This is the same principle the slot machines run under, that you pull and you pull and you pull and you don't know, it's unexpected when you're going to get the payoff, but it's a, it's a, behavioral, um, it's a behavioral principle. Uh, and so in the very same way, social media companies have created slot machines. Uh, and that's how social media uh, operates. That's how, uh, why it's so addictive, or partly why it's so addictive. It's literally a drug. And this is why people can check their phones hundreds of times a day. People get up in the middle of the night to check their phone is because they want that, that dopamine hit. We, you know, we evolved over millions of years um, and our brains, well, they just have not had time to catch up with all of these technological changes. Our, our, our brains, in fact, haven't changed in 75,000 years in any significant way. And it used to be quite difficult to get uh, these types of pleasures, this type of uh, dopamine hit. Um, and so 
Now we can get that, that dopamine hit whenever we want to. It's right there. It's at our fingertips. We can just open our phone and, uh, and, and, and get that little bit of pleasure from it. And so it used to be, well, how would a person get a, a dopamine hit? Well, maybe food, maybe sex, some type of real world experience. That's sometimes hard to do. It takes time as well and, and real effort to you know, get those things. Now, there's no effort. It literally is as simple as grabbing your phone, touching the screen, and touching an app. And uh, as well as everything that people can see as well um, you know, in the different video platforms. And so we're, our brains are completely out of their depth. We, um, we are in over our heads in a very real way, where most of us, um, our, our minds have been hacked. When we think about computer hackers. Well, there are mind hackers. And in, in, in that way, social media companies have hacked our brains. Uh, they know exactly how to push our buttons. And as a result, this, they make billions and billions of dollars for their advertisers. Uh, and we'll be getting into maybe um, different things people can do uh, to maybe get out of the matrix, um, to unhack their, their brains. But I think it's important to lay this foundation uh, before we get uh, into talking about the, the impact of social media on adolescents specifically, is that we are all susceptible to these risks. Uh, you know, social media has done a, one, a number on everybody of all ages. It's just that it has had perhaps in, in the most deleterious effects on young people. So let's uh, let's get into that. So you can see if you can, people can rhetorically, but people can guess this generation. Or maybe we're all uh, most of us are familiar with the greatest generation that went through uh, the Great Depression and then fought World War II, and then because they they came back and had a lot of kids, of course, and that's the baby boomers, and then. You had the smallest generation, um, which is uh, mine, Generation X, right? And then there were the millennials. Well, now there's this, this youngest generation. There's one that's upcoming. They're, they're still under 10 years old. But uh, the focus of today's presentation is really on, on the Gen Zers that were born between 1995 and 2012. Uh, because when, when uh, sociologists and psychologists look at the generational differences, there's oftentimes more in common. There's more uh, similarities than there are differences between the generations, but there are also distinctions, cultural events, historical happenings, and shift a, a whole generation's perspective. Technology has a huge influence in that way too. And, but we typically will see a, a smooth transition in, in attitudes or perspectives or meaning making from one generation to the next. But we saw something that was really unprecedented when we looked at the transition from millennials to Gen Zers, stark contrast, very, very distinct generations in many, many ways. Uh, and the focus today is gonna to be on the impact on their mental health. And what we've seen is sharp drop-offs in uh, Gen, Gen Zers mental health as compared to the millennials or Gen Xers or baby boomers or, or the greatest generation. Uh, so start exploring that here. Um, we, we, we know that cell phones and smart, uh, you know, smart uh, smartphones and, and uh, social media apps are ubiquitous with, with the Gen Zers. Uh, three out of four have a have a phone when they are in middle school. Many elementary students nowadays have phones. Um, most have Instagram accounts. Um, most have TikTok accounts as well. Facebook not so much. Facebook seems to be something that's used primarily by by older adults nowadays and adults. Uh, they they have no memory of a time before the internet. Their their lives have always existed in, in, uh, in use with social media, with smartphones, with this kind of technology. It's very much ingrained into 
um, their day-to-day -day lives in, in a way that if you're a little bit older, you can remember a time when there weren't you know, social media, there, there weren't our phones that, uh, that you could get onto uh, and Google anything or watch anything. Uh, you know, if you're a little bit older, you remember a time where you didn't even have a computer. Uh, all of your time was in the real world. There was no digital world to be a part of. And so we have that memory. We can remember that. that okay, there, we can live without our phones. <laughs> we don't need social media as our, as our primary way of connecting with people because we experience what it was like uh, not to have our phones or social media is so ingrained into our lives. That is not the case with the Gen Zers. They, they have no memory of that because it didn't exist. Social media has always been a part of their lives. It's not uncommon for a two-year-old uh, to know how to open up an iPad Pro, get right to the app they want to get to, find the games they want to get to, go to YouTube, put, you know, find the video they want to watch. At two years old, three years old, uh, they are completely uh, competent uh, and uh, um, very familiar with how to use apps, how to use uh, social media. Uh, so they've lived their lives on these phones and it's very much part of it. it the message here today is gonna to be one of kind of raising the, the alarm. Uh, and uh, along with that though, I think it is important to understand that, you know, to say that there are many positives, there are many pros, um, it's not all cons, of course. If, if you have family on the other side of the country, uh, be able to get into Zoom or get into use Facebook to show pictures or, or Instagram. These are ways to share our lives with loved ones who we can't be with as well as with friends. Uh, through COVID time, it's almost impossible to imagine what that would have been like if we hadn't had Zoom, if we hadn't had uh, different kinds of social media in order to share our lives with people who we were physically disconnected from. And, and all of these things are very positive. And uh, it's important to say as well that it's not going away. We're, we're, no one's going to press any type of uh, red button that's going to um, delete or destroy all social media uh, apps. It is here to stay. It's a part of our lives now. And the question isn't really about uh, abstaining from social media use or not, you know, just turning in your, your iPhone, going back to a, uh, a Samsung flip up phone, which some people are doing. I, I think it's more about learning how to live with social media in a way that is not, well, soul destroying, <laughs> in a way that our brains are not constantly being hacked. Um, and so it's learning some responsibilities and guidelines around it. And I think going back to the tsunami metaphor, this technology washed over us so quickly. I, I think now is, is the time though where we have to stick our heads up and look around and say, okay, uh, we got hit hard by this, but what do we do next? How do we take back our control? How do we take the reins? So um, gaming is another, uh, it's not social media per se, um, but it's often lumped in together. There are many pauses around gaming and video games. And, and sometimes we think of these as childish or, or we think of these as somehow just as this kind of well, soft form of entertainment. But for many people, gaming is a big part of their lives and that's not a bad thing. There's, there's community um, oftentimes form around different games. Um, there is real challenge in, in many games. It requires skill. It requires problem solving. And in and, and, Getting better at something is a, you know, is a, probably a deep psychological need. We want to experience mastery. We we want to set goals and achieve those goals. Uh, we need challenges, and we want to feel competent. We want to feel like we're good at something, um, and we want community. And video games can accomplish all of those things for for people. They can also probably overrun a person's life and become something that's a complete time suck to the point where they don't get anything else done in life. So any good thing can be taken too far. But, you know, gaming and social media have their, have their uh, positive 
uh, functions they, they, they can be they can be something really good for people it's just they can also be taken uh, well, too far so let's look at now some of the data that's come in around uh, the impact of social media on, the, on young people this is a generational breakdown uh, this is the percent reporting excellent or very good mental health. You can see that uh, from older adults down to boomers to Gen Xers to millennials uh, to Gen Z, it's it's you know, generally stair step down. Now uh, Gen Z, forty five percent reporting excellent to very good mental health, um, and you can see that that, that precipitous drop between millennials and Gen Zers. Depressive symptoms. Uh, the blue line here is I can't do anything right. Uh, the yellow line, my life is not useful. The purple line, do not enjoy life. And you can see that these the these three lines took a a, a stark jump up in about 2000, let's just say 11, 2012, and actually started to trend up even sooner than that. Uh, maybe around 2007, 2008. That time frame from between 2007-ish to 2011-ish is going to be seen over and over and over again when we look at the data. Something happened in that time period. Something happened between about 2007 and 2011 that had a huge negative impact on, on Gen Zers' mental health. This is major depressive episodes. The blue line is 12 to 17 year olds. The yellow line is 18 to 24 year olds. So there's 12 to 17 year olds, the younger people. And again, about 2011 started a huge climb. Uh, that's approximately a, what is that? Um, oh gosh, I'm not to, I, it's, it's hundreds, hundreds of percent increase in major depressive episodes for, for younger adolescents, as well as young adults. Feeling left out and lonely. Uh, again, the blue line often feel left out. It started to spike up around 2007, in that range, 2008. Often feeling lonely, the same thing. It started to go up again for our, our teenagers. Suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. Uh, for both groups, went up about the same. Um, from, from 12 to 14 year olds, that is a, um, about a 150% increase. And it's even more for the 15 to 17 year olds. So suicide ideation, suicide attempts up uh, significantly since about 2009. The suicide rate. Um, for 12 to 14 year olds, it is up 200%. Uh, from 15 to 19 year olds, it's up more than that, hundreds of percent. Uh, and so when, when people in the field of uh, mental health and psychology and sociology, epidemiology, they see these types of, of just dramatic increases in forms of mental illness. It's really our charge is to figure out why and what the heck is going on. Um, it's very disturbing. This is getting together with friends informally. This is starting to maybe put the puzzle pieces together here in terms of why we've seen such, uh, such dramatic changes. You can see that for up and through the 80s and through the the 90s up until about 2000 and let's just say six or seven again that's when the slide really took off it's trending down a little bit not much but trending down a bit and then it looks like a playground slide again around 2007 2008 for all for all ages another piece of the puzzle sleeping less than seven hours a night so I talked earlier about how many adolescents wake up in the middle of the night to check their phones and to talk with their friends or to get on Instagram or TikTok. Uh, it, it's having a major impact on the quality of their sleep and the time spent sleeping. Again, since about 2000 and uh, 
it probably began around 2011 in that range. For the older students who probably had their phones sooner than the younger people, but once the younger people caught up uh, and became about the same age, you know, uh, closer to high school, middle school, they also started to shoot up too. So what's this? Maybe an explanation of all this is, well, we had that great recession in 2008, 2009. So maybe all that, maybe it's because of that great recession. You know, unemployment reached about 10%. So maybe there was a lot of uh, stress in the family system because you know, a parent maybe lost their job or whatever it may have been. Yeah, but no, uh, that's not what the data shows. You can see the unemployment rate did shoot up in 2009, 2008, 2009, but it's dropped back down while depression has gone up. Depression mirrors smartphone adoption and time online. And not just depression, if you look at anxiety, suicide ideation, um, lost time with friends, lost time sleeping, all of those lines match up with smartphone adoption and time online. So here's the relative risk of having um, you know, suicidal, a one plus suicidal risk factor. So if you're sleeping more than seven hours a night, that significantly reduces the risk of suicide ideation. It's a major, it's a major factor, particularly for adolescents. Involvement in sports or exercise, again, has a, has a significant impact. TV has a uh, small negative effect, while time spent on electronic devices has a significant negative effect on increasing suicidal uh, risk. Here's another, another one here. We, we see in self-competence, and in self-liking uh, with millennials generally okay with themselves, uh, you know, generally like themselves all right. And then um, with the Gen Zers then, really falling, you know, falling way off. Um, you know, you can, you can tell by the timeline where the millennials are uh, and when the Gen Zers are coming up. And it's around that 2008, 2009, where Gen Zers, really again took that slide down into um into real mental illness so you know the, all this begs the question right is it really the digital media use you know is it really time spent on our phones and social media is that what's increased this level of depression well again we see that depression increased along with these other kinds of mental illnesses at the same time the smartphones became common and ubiquitous more time on the screens, less time in non-screen activities uh, is linked to depression and, and unhappiness. Uh, and a longitudinal study uh, is, is found as well that uh, people who spend more time on social media experience over that period of time a decreasing level of mental health. Uh, in one study that's pretty famous, they uh, two random groups. One group spent so much time on Facebook every week, and the other group um, didn't spend any time on Facebook, uh, and then looked to see what impact would have. And, and well, the group that spent that time on Facebook experienced significantly less mental health. But I want to focus now on particularly um, girls, young girls, um, teenage girls, because they seem to be the ones who are being hit the hardest. From all this. Um, of course, that's me and that's, uh, that's, my, that's my daughter, Dunya. This quote that I came across by Sean Parker, Sean Parker, who's founding president of Facebook, along with Mark Zuckerberg, uh, said, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. Uh, that, that was very prescient. Um, major depressive disorders ages 12 to 17 is up significantly with females. Um, but with boys, it is not significantly changed. So again, this is around 2011 is when it started to go up for females um, and uh, up, up a little bit, but not nearly the same amount for, for boys. So social media has had overall a more negative impact on girls than it's had on, had on boys. 
For example, um, some more data. Since 2011, nearly twice as many teenage girls now end their own lives. A 200% increase. For non-fatal self-inflicted injuries among 15 to 19-year-old uh, girls is up 200%, uh, while among 10 to 14-year-olds, it's up 300%. The rates for non-fatal self-inflicted injuries per 100,000 is 620 um, for girls, and it's 40 for boys. It's not changed in the same period of time. Looking at college students, you um, can see that uh, we're seeing major spikes in mental illness reported in, among, among college students, among particularly female college students. It's up from 37% uh, uh, to 51% from 2010 to 2016, um, which is the last time that I could find data on this. I can only imagine where it is now, but we cross a threshold where now a majority of uh, female college students have, uh, have an anxiety or depressive disorder, a majority. We hear about FOMO, probably familiar with fear of missing out, but um, it's, it's not clear if social media is causing FOMO as much as it's causing faux blow, which is fear of being left out. Fear of missing out was something maybe experienced back before it went out of the phone. You just weren't in the right place at the right time to get the news, to hear about the party, to find out your friends are going to the movie, um, and so you didn't want to miss out. So maybe you make the phone call to find out what everyone's doing. Well, with full glow, everybody knows what everyone's doing at all times. And so to not go to the movies doesn't mean that you just didn't get the news. It means that you were purposely left out because anyone can be contacted anywhere at any moment. Uh, and so with fear of being left out, you wouldn't find out maybe until Monday morning when you got to school that, oh, there was a party uh, on Saturday or some of your friends went to the movies on Friday night. It's been days since that happened. And maybe they don't even tell you. So um, with full blow, though, what happens is your friends go to the movies and they live stream it or they put pictures uh, on Instagram of them at the movie theater. and so. Now you find out while it's still happening that, you, that you're not there. And you know you could have been invited. Why weren't you invited? Or in the worst case scenarios, maybe there's a party going on and you get on Instagram or you get into TikTok or wherever it might be, and people are live streaming, uh, or maybe on Facebook, live streaming the party. And then maybe somebody says something negative to you. Like, wish you were here, ha, 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 ha. And you see that, which happens quite a bit. So it's used as a as kind of a social weapon. So fear of being left out is up dramatically, um, again, since about 20, 2011, 2012, um, particularly among females um, who tend to engage in more types of social violence as opposed to physical violence, even though physical violence is not uncommon, females too, but uh, females tend to use, girls tend to use more uh, kinds of social uh, social violence, and in that in that sense, then um, social media and apps become the ideal weapon um, for social violence. So um, it's a twenty five percent increase since twenty ten. Um, you know, it, it, and as well, when we get into Instagram, we are really seeing people's curated museums to themselves, it's like <laughs> they are the display. They're, the museum is for them. We all have our own social media museums and we, cur we curate, we put the pictures we want people to see in, the, in that, in that uh, video museum, uh, the pictorial museum. And oftentimes, well, we'll touch it up a bit or a lot. You probably have all seen these new AI apps where you can literally change your face 
And, and as you talk, it, it looks like you talking. It, it, and you can, you can touch your face, it touches its face. It's, it's you, and you can look like you know, anywhere you want to look. But it's not you. Um, so we're, we're bombarded by these, uh, these messages of what the beauty standards are supposed to be and how people are supposed to look. And for, for young girls, particularly when they see these, these images uh, and they, then they look at themselves in the mirror or they see what their pictures look like undoctored and they feel, they feel ugly. Are they ugly? No. But by these impossible standards that are created by, well, by these apps or even by artificial intelligence, they don't stand a chance. Uh, and like I, like I said a minute ago, girls tend to engage more in, in social and relational kinds of violence. And again, the, the, metaphorically, the social media app, a phone is like a handgun for some, some of these, uh, these kids. The damage that they can inflict the pain and the suffering that they can inflict through social media is, uh, it really cannot be underestimated. Um, the other thing with it is there is no escape. When most of us were kids and you had some kind of beef with somebody or there was some argument or something fight going on, well, okay, but that was at school. And, and then you went home. And then you were home and maybe you played with your neighborhood friends or maybe you did your homework or maybe you watched television. But you didn't have to deal with it. You didn't have to, maybe it was on your mind, but you weren't having to deal with that drama or whatever that was, that fight, until you went back to school the next day. But you had to reprieve. You had some time just to kind of unwind from it, to plan out what you're going to do or how you want to respond. But now, it just follows you home because social media is everywhere at once. And if you have your phone with you at all times, which most people do, there is no reprieve. There is no escape. It's always with you. Uh, and so there's no coming down from the stress. It, it's like a, it's a chronic stress where people can't remove themselves or get away from it, which is very difficult to do. Um, we know that screens and happiness don't mix well, uh, for probably for any age, but um, it seems to be particularly uh, damaging, for, again, for young people. You can see here the relative risk of being unhappy drops significantly if you engage in regular sports and exercise, if you're religious, uh, in-person social interactions, um, just reading print media, working, homework, all those things uh, actually um, decrease the risk of being unhappy. While on the other side, these are all activities that involve screens, TV, texting, computer games, social networking, internet, all, all increase the risk for being unhappy. So uh, we try to quantify it and figure out, okay, well, how much time is too much time? Is there a right amount of social media where it's not so damaging? Uh, still figuring that one out, but we do know that two plus hours per day of screen time significantly increases the risk for depression and suicide. It's a sign statistically significant uh, increase. Three plus hours a day increases the likelihood that an adolescent will commit suicide by 71%. And what percentage of adolescents are spending three plus hours a day in social media? The vast majority. So what do we do about all this? And I, I do want to take your questions and, and, uh, and have time to field, field those at the end. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up here uh, pretty soon, but let's think about here what we can do about it. You know, how, how is all of this risk mitigated? And it's a challenge. And I, I certainly understand that challenge. I have a 10 year old son and a 12 year old daughter uh, and helping them to navigate this is difficult. Even with all that I know about these risks, it's a challenge to talk to them. Um, it's a challenge to protect them uh, and to help guide them. With older kids uh, who are maybe more independent, uh, who in many ways are, are already very adult-like when they're 16, 17 years old, I mean, it's not like they're six or seven where you just can take their phone away. It's a little harder 
Uh, so I understand that. I think then the number one thing you can do to help your, your kids is to talk to them about the risk of social media. That's what I did when this goes back probably two years ago, three years ago, right, right around the start of COVID. And I told them, hey, this is what the data shows. This is what happens. You know, these are the real uh, risks uh, yeah, that, can, uh, that can occur if you get into social media. I'm not comfortable with you being on social media for these reasons. Now, my kids may be, they may be uh, rare in their response. I don't, I'm not sure, but they understood that and they didn't want to. They saw the risks and they, they took ownership of that. So I don't want to use it. I don't want to get Instagram. I don't want to get on TikTok. I can see its negative effects. And I was very proud of them that they had that wisdom. I can also though imagine someone else saying, no, I want to use it. <laughs> All my friends are using it. Of course I want to use it. What are you talking about, dad? Um, and that, that happens too. But I do think having that conversation so they, they understand what these risks are, they understand your concerns, uh, and then they can understand later when maybe you have to take stronger actions to protect them. Uh, also have conversations about how they want to be treated online. We, we of course, teach kids as young as kindergartners how to um, treat each other with respect, how treat, teaching young kids how they should be treated respectfully, creating boundaries, uh, you know, helping, helping young people to develop a voice where they can speak up for themselves. And yet we've not really done a good job of, of equipping young people to have that same integrity, the same boundaries, that same self-respect or treating others with respect online. Uh, you know, you, you, see the, you see otherwise very rational, happy, healthy people turn into uh, I mean, something like uh, Neanderthals savages online. They say things that they would never say to another person in person to their face. Uh, and there's something about the anonymity of it, something about the distance, something that doesn't seem as real uh, when it's uh, a digital space. And yet its effects on other people are just as real. Its effects on the person themselves who is doing it is just as real. So I think we need to create guidelines about how to treat each other with respect in online spaces, that it matters. It matters a great deal. The same way that you would treat somebody in person, that's how you treat them online. If you wouldn't say it to their face, then don't say it online. Uh, the students, again, or the, the kids understanding these risks so they can navigate them themselves. And, and, and some level, they have to buy into that. They have to want to protect themselves. They have to see uh, the risks and, and, and think to themselves, I don't want to experience that. I want to navigate this. I want to be healthy. Um, and helping them to, 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 to do that, to navigate these shark-infested waters, I think it's, it's extremely important. Um, know which social media platforms your your children are using. And if they're if they're talking about some app or some social media platform that you've never heard of, well, you need to find out what is it, how's it work. Um, don't be that kind of out of touch, um, you know, adult that doesn't understand how to turn the computer on. You know, you, you need to be fluent in this language. You need to understand it. Don't assume that it's all okay. Don't assume, well, you know, this is what kids do nowadays. Well, yeah, but there's some really negative consequences when adults leave the room and have no idea what their what their children are doing. Um, establish clear expectations for how they should act online. You know, holding them accountable and responsible. Um, checking in. Um, you know, they're not going to want you reading their text messages. And on some level, I can understand that. And it can seem like an invasion of privacy. And it kind of is. But, you know, when you kind of weighing out the ethics here, there is the invasion of privacy of, of checking in, reading text with also, well, protecting your children because you love them and doing what parents you know, have always done, which is, you know, 
I'm going to check in. I'm going to see what you're up to for your good because I do care for you because I love you. Uh, and that's a tension there. And I don't have a perfect solution to that tension. Uh, and it should involve conversation with your children about accountability, uh, about checking in, about knowing what they're putting online. Uh, so it's not a surprise later. Uh, I had a client uh, pretty recently who's a high school student who friend told her that she was um, thinking of committing suicide. And uh, my client said to her friend, do your parents know? And she said, no, my parents don't know, just, just my friends online. And that kind of disconnection is, is of course, is, is, uh, is heartbreaking. Uh, that her friends online in her online world know that she's thinking about killing herself, but her parents don't. Uh, and with there's follow up to that, just, just so we know, there's, there's uh, mandatory, uh, mandatory reporting and whatnot that was taken, uh, took place then to protect this girl. But uh, it's important that we know uh, uh, ignorance is not an excuse. Rule if it's not okay to say or do something uh, face to face, it's not okay online. Okay, other, other suggestions here. Place parameters on use, certain hours a day, uh, which platforms are okay, which are not. There's a lot of debate right now around TikTok. Um, of course, there's even um, the possibility that TikTok will be banned in the United States. This is some legislation that way. Other countries have already banned it. Uh, you know, in, this is not that talk. You know, I probably have opinions about it. People have different opinions about that. Uh, I, what's not opinion is that there are a lot of risks with TikTok um, as well as the other platforms. And I would look long and hard at it as a parent of, a, of an adolescent, whether or not you want your children to be on TikTok. Um, yeah, I would look at that very, very critically and, and know what they're looking at. If they're gonna be looking at it, that decision is made fine, but you should know what they're what they're observing. Um, this can seem draconian to some parents who would take a more laissez-faire approach to actually restrict uh, or ban uh, certain certain platforms. Uh, you know, people have different levels of comfort with that. Uh, I would say that for me, um, this is me. My kids won't have access to Instagram, TikTok, and most other social media platforms for a long time, for the foreseeable future. Uh, there does seem to be a, a particular risk for young girls between about the age of 10 or 11 and about 14. That seems to be a very, very sensitive period of time where um, these girls are most at risk to the negative effects of social media. And so I would suggest to you as a counselor uh, that you get them through at least that time period. Get them to later, a little bit later in high school, 15, 16, before they start to use these. Will it still have some negative effects even then? Yes, but it doesn't tend to have the same level of damage. Um, it's here to stay. And again, I don't want this to sound Pollyannish or the sound like uh, I'm a Luddite. <laughs> I understand technology is here. I use social media to some extent. Uh, certainly technology is integrated into my life. I take my phone with me everywhere. Uh, and I understand that we're not, we're not going back in time. But like I said in the beginning, we just have to figure out how to use this in a, in a more healthy way. And also, let's just not forget that kids need other things to do besides being on their phones. They really do. They need time spent in nature. Nature is a huge elixir. It has, a, it has an almost magical uh, impact on, of all ages, people's well-being. Uh, we need that time in nature. Sports, uh, different kinds of activities, uh, music and art, joining clubs and having hobbies, just doing homework. Uh, journaling, writing, traveling, chores even. All of these things uh, have a positive impact on mental health. And so if, if, 
if uh, your children are going to be in social media, okay. But what else are they doing that's going to maybe offset some of uh, damage, some of the negative effects of social media? And these are some suggestions. So this, yeah. And that's my daughter um, a few years ago. So thank you um, for uh, hearing me today talk about the risks of social media, sounding the alarm. Uh, and, and I do invite your, your questions. You can reach out to me also anytime, email me. I'm always uh, more than willing to, to, to chat about this, to offer you my suggestions, offer you any help that I can maybe send you in the direction of, of other resources that could uh, be helpful to you. So let's, um, let's open up and see if anyone has any questions. Um, you can, we can do chat, uh, or if you want to just raise your voice and say, hey, that works too. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead. Does anyone have any thoughts or any questions before we end? Yes, I can. Um, if you were to share an email, or maybe with uh, with Carlos here, or send it to me privately in chat, I will send you resources or the references. Yes, great question. Uh, I I wanted it purposely to be pre-pandemic data because the epidemic and the social distancing and the loss of structure and the loss of routine and all of that had huge negative effects, but that would also then make it harder to discern the impact of, of, of social media uh, specifically. Um, and so we have more of a controlled, uh, in some way, kind of a controlled analysis of this data from 2019 earlier. And so we can see that the, that these mental illness trends were already going the wrong direction. They were trending down. Um, and so we know it's not all just because of, of COVID. Uh, so that's why all this data is pre-COVID. What we know though is, is COVID, like almost in, in almost every area of our lives, it's just through kerosene on the fire. Whatever trend was happening already just increased fivefold, tenfold with COVID. And so with mental illness already uh, going, going up, uh, well-being going down, COVID has had huge effects over time, and particularly in, in, uh, when students uh, weren't going to school, with social distancing, weren't spending time uh, in person with their friends. They lost time in different activities that provided their life with, with enjoyment, pleasure, with meaning, with purpose. Um, by some accounts, the suicide rate has gone up 300% in the last three years. Yeah. Um, it, it, the, the, the epidemic, um, COVID itself, mainly hit adults, and particularly older adults. Um, in terms of the physical consequences of, of, of the illness, of, of the virus. But there's an epidemic now. And there's an epidemic of mental illness among, among young people. Um, I would call it that. Um, some more questions here. Um, this, I've, I've done some workshops at different schools and um, Different schools have created different policies around having phones during the day. It's sticky because some parents want or insist that their students have their phones during the day so that they can you know, chat with their parents or if there's an emergency that they can contact their parents. Uh, I don't think this has gotten to the courts yet. I don't think there's any legal precedence around this. Um, but that's been a, sometimes a barrier to schools just banning cell phones. 
Right. But there are schools, even public schools, that tell kids don't bring your school your phone to school. If we see it, we'll confiscate it. We'll give it to you at the end of the day. Many, many private schools have done this. Um, at one point, when we were back in Seattle, oh, we were working at this private school, and then we went and did the tour, and they had this basically like a big box in the principal's office um, that was full of phones. And so when the kids came to school in the morning, they would just drop their phone off, and then they wouldn't have access to the phone again until the end of the day. And that was a private school, uh, and the parents were in general agreement about that. Uh, Everything that I found out, though, about how phones and social media can be used as a weapon, it makes me personally very uncomfortable with the idea of having phones in, in school. Um, but I realized as well, many parents don't feel that way. They want, their, they want their kids to have it. I think it starts with conversation. You have to have these conversations with the parents, um, expressing your concerns, expressing how phones are used as well for distraction, and they can also be used in, in really negative ways, very, very kind of socially violent ways in school. And I, it would be nice if the kids at least had a few hours every day where they're not on their phones, where they're not potentially negatively impacted by, by social media. It would be nice to have a reprieve where, okay, at least from nine o'clock until 2.30, I'm, I'm not looking at my phone. I'm not being you know, I guess some way I can almost break this addictive pattern um, and have some space. Um, okay, next question. Um, yes, it is. It's an addiction. And we've, we've all, I think, become used to having our phones with us. If you forget, if you get in your car and you drive a half a mile away from your home and you realize that you forgot your phone, most people will turn around and go back and get it. Most people will even turn around and go back and get it, even if they got to work. If they can afford being late, they'll go home and get their phone. We experience that little bit of a, of a panic attack when we realize we don't have our phone. And in, in some regards, we've become cyborgs. You know, these types of technologies are so integrated into our lives now that, yeah, it's not implanted. The phone isn't implanted in my arm. But I kind of might as well be. I mean, I carry it. Um, you know, some of this technology coming, it, it, will, it will be in our eyeglasses very soon. Um, you'll, the screen will be up. And it'll even through Neuralink, you'll just be able to think, uh, send an email and say, uh, hi, mom, I'm still coming over this weekend. I'll bring the cake. And the email will be sent. That's just a year or two away. Um, so it's going to get even harder to control um, many of these kinds of technologies. But the, but the rageful addict is real. And uh, having those conversations about the risks and deciding as a school what are your policies going to be, uh, you know, that, that's still in your wheelhouse. That's in your purview to, to make those decisions. And a kid might not like it, but uh, it, uh, that's okay. Now, if they turn violent, that's a whole other issue, I suppose. How this happened too. Um, As social media led to less stable and, and unhealthy identity development. Um, I'm not as familiar with identity development and social media use. You know, identity development is, is something that a lot of young people historically forever have struggled with figuring out who they are and having a strong sense of a uh, 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 strong positive sense of who they are and, and feel good. Uh, Kind of healthy ego development and knowing their values and, and being comfortable in their own skin. Um, that's always been a bit of an issue. Teenage angst and figuring out who we are in this world is something that I experienced. Uh, but with social media use, yes, it's going to raise even more questions. It's going to create even more stress around these things, even more confusion as well, figuring out who I am. Um, so yes, I can, it's definitely contributed to uh, identity development. Um, okay. Yeah, 
the cell phone, uh, cell phone use in schools, again, that's come up again and again in the questions. I think if my, my opinion, my, my opinion as a mental health counselor is if you can create a no cell phone space in your school and get away with it, I, I think that the pros outweigh the cons significantly uh, for all the reasons that we've, uh, we've touched on here. Well, thank you uh, for your time. And I happily uh, respond to any emails. Some of you have shared your emails. I'll send references uh, to you. And uh, good luck with this. This is a, a major issue and uh, it's something that we're still getting our heads around and trying to figure out, you know, how do we help support um, our young people moving forward? Uh, and we don't have all the answers yet, but we also have some ideas about, you know, how that can be done. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great day.